profile in these events in no way rose to the honor that has been bestowed upon me as state representative. I would also like to confirm that it was a mistake to not have clear guidelines on the strict use of government time by my staff. This created an untenable situation for them and for the official office in Lansing. This caused a lack of clarity of roles and responsibilities and caused difficulty in delineating personal, political, and official duties for the staff. Maintaining and allowing joint staffing was a mistake. I regret that the combine, combining of the staff improperly and inextricably intertwined personal and political matters. Moreover, I will be cognizant of how I treat my staff in the future. These failures were mine alone, and for these failures I offer my most heartfelt apology. I've already taken steps to eliminate the conflict with staff working on legislative, political, and personal tasks. We are in compliance with the House Business Office rules. All of the above stated issues have been corrected and new staff has been in place in serving constituents. Constituent calls, emails, and letters are being returned promptly and respectfully. I understand and accept any conditions placed upon my office by the House of Representatives as it relates to my request for censure. I would ask that the members of the State House accept my censure to allow this regretful chapter to close. I believe this is the best outcome possible for both the 82nd District and also for the people of our great state. I believe, in my, I believe and my constituents believe that I'm qualified for the job, other, otherwise I would not have been elected, and I still have their support. As General Counsel stated yesterday, there is no bright line as it relates to the issues before this committee. The question is, does the events described in the report alone show that I have no honor or integrity? I must indicate no. While the events in the report are horrible, there is much left unsaid about me and the work that I've done since being elected. If I believe censored, I believe is censored, I will be able to restore my dignity and that of the office and this institution. I will be able to effective to be effective and know that I can rebuild the public trust through my actions. As Winston Churchill stated, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. I have failed, but I remain not enthusiastic about the opportunities that are before us. Finally, these, these responsibilities are mine and mine alone. And for these failures, I offer my most heartfelt apology and I understand and accept any conditions placed upon my office by the House of Representatives as it relates to my request for censure. I would ask that the members of the State House accept my censure, however harsh they deem appropriate, and to allow this regretful chapter to close. I believe this is the best outcome possible, both for the 82nd District and also for the people of our great state. And God bless you, each one of you, for your service. Thank you. Any of your legal counsel prepared to say anything? I actually have. Um, I'd like to speak um, to the. I'm going to have to kind of go off this for a second because I I, I think the a lot of this relates to the qualifications and um, Mr. Schwartzel laid that out pretty specifically yesterday. I think I need to kind of explain this um, this idea of the hostile work environment and also the email, which is in, as best I can tell you without. Um, without prepared uh, notes in that, but uh, the relationship I had um, with these, uh, with Ben and Josh, um, Ben Graham and <laughs> my staff, and, and I know the emails kind of point to that. Um, but those are moments, uh, moments that happened, and it's hard to really explain. I, I had a, um, a relationship with these guys that goes back to Ben's wedding when he's barely old enough to drive and open houses and, you know, with their family. And, and, and with Josh, I prayed with him more times than I can count. And so my personal relationship with these guys really trumped you know, it was, uh, 
I had a, a relationship with them that was um, that were the more intense relationships as far as friendship that I had. And I'm pretty particular about the people that are with me. And that friendship, uh, I just have to say it, I mean, I can't say it any other way. Um, you know, I, lo I love them both. And it's, uh, it still hurts. Um, to think that those relationships are separate. Uh, I, I don't know how to really explain it, but even going into it, it wasn't that I, you know, um, I wanted them to be a part of what was happening here and they wanted desperately to be in Lansing and I wanted that for them. But their skill set didn't quite fit on the front end. And we had numerous conversations about that and I can tell you even today when the revelations come out about Josh and that situation, my heart breaks for him and his family and, and I'm hoping in the future um, that those relationships can be restored. I don't, I don't hold any ill will to either one of them. Uh, I, I don't. And it's tough in, in a situation where, you know, there's all this theater happening around us and all the cameras and all of that, but in reality, uh, you know, these guys were with me for years. In Josh's case, I've known the family for 25 years. And, you know, it does, it absolutely breaks my heart. But when I came into the new position of being the state representative, I had now responsibility for administration to the district. And these guys have some amazing talents. You know, fighting political battle after political battle didn't really translate to being good administrators. And, and I'm the one responsible for that. It's me. Um, I just wanted to share with you folks that uh, in, in reality, um, this isn't me firing them because I was hostile. It, the, the, other, the other case is really the truth. I didn't want them to go. There's no desire for that. And, you know, I know that people say, why did they do it? I get this question every single day from people. Why would they do that? Why would he tape you? I think the revelation of my, my failure, I do. I think the revelation of my failure, they found out about it back in February. And I think the revelation of my failure inside of that, and also the fact that our relationship was kind of being torn away, meaning it wasn't working in Lansing, I think it hurt them. And, and so it's difficult as I sit here because obviously this is playing out in public. Um, but in, in reality, you know, I'm responsible for all of that. I'm responsible for this room being here today and all you folks having to take part of your summer um, to deal with this. But I just don't want that to be lost in the mix. You know, these guys were, um, they're, they're even now, um, you know, I, I wish the best for them and their families. And I wish they could have gotten jobs um, in other places, and I'm, I'm sure they're going to go on to success. But I wanted you folks to know that, that in reality, um, you know, those relationships were court, court to me, and I think they were to them. And knowing their testimonies and all of that, and them knowing mine, I think it was just a tremendous failure knowing what I had done. And it was. And uh, they were sons on occasion and brothers on occasion and fraternity brothers on occasion. Um, and yeah, did I, did I growl at them on occasion when things didn't get done or weren't done right? I did. I did. Um, so I, um, um, I think I need to, to talk about, just for a minute, um, the email in the recording. I think you folks need to hear it because I think you listened to it and I think you guys have listened to it, the, it's the committee, and God bless you for suffering through it. I don't know how many times you've had to go through it. Um, you know, when I listen to it, you know, the, I don't recognize myself. I don't, you know, even after I listened to it and tried to explain 
what actually happened in those moments and what led up to those moments. And people say, what was he trying to do? Um, and say, was, he, was it a misdirection? Was it to find out who the texter was? Or is it deflection? Um, there were the steps of a desperate person. There were the steps of a person who, you know, the revelation of those things were going to come out in the next few minutes. And those things were going to happen. And that was mixed in with a really serious personal, personal moment of, of uh, I didn't, you know, I, I don't think the tape really kind of reflects where I was at. Um, I, it wasn't about the, the covering it up. Like what was going on there when I look back and the, the craziness of all of that. Um, I wanted to die. It was a really, really desperate and difficult spot. And, you know, when you're in that spot, and I hope to God none of you are or have ever been in that spot, but there were a whole bunch of things at play, you know, whether they're health and um, also the, the situation in regards to my, um, my family. At that point, my mother knew. At that point, my brother knew. And I was either telling my wife that night or in the next night or two. I don't know if you know what that's like to have to reveal those things to your spouse and know that your children are going to have to face those things. Um, but that's where I was at. So every concrete embankment, every tree, every moment, um, they weren't just concrete embankments anymore. They weren't. They were options. And it was difficult for those moments. And I look back now, months later, and I try to explain it. I listened to the tape myself, and I stepped out to kind of collect myself again. Um, I listened to those moments, and I think, what the hell do you do with that? You know, what, what, do, you, what do you do with that? Because when I listened to the tape, and you know, Brock did a nice job of setting up the prosecution, you know, what, what do you do with that? If I don't know what to do with that, and I'm the one that was there and went through it, I don't know what you folks do with that. I mean, just being honest. Um, so I, I thank you for, you know, trying to wade through this. And um, sure, I would, you know, like to um, go back and change the things that I've done. I can't. There, it was a... It was a crazy moment by a man who was in a really desperate spot. And yet I, I felt like that it, I owed you folks really what was happening in my mind and also with those relationships. And it's difficult at times to be able to um, come forward and try to explain it because you can't explain the unexplainable. It was a difficult time. There was a tape made when ben, ben Graham knew or didn't know or Josh knew or didn't know or Keith knew or didn't know. Our understanding is they knew back in February sometime. And I think that they were broken hearted for the relationships that we had. And it was all changing. And <laughs> that was really difficult for all of us. And just because you have friends doesn't mean that it's a good idea for you to work together or try to put together the next steps in your life and I think this is a case in point of failure of leadership on my part and it was so I I get to this spot and I look at it and quite honestly when I look at the tape and hear it and heard it in Tim Bullen's office um, in its entirety and I, I listen to the tape, and it sounds like a complete record, and yet I don't really recognize myself in those moments. Um, there was a lot of pressure. Obviously, the anonymous texture was part of that. But there's the pressure of the idea of having to reveal all of this to, to you all and to the public in general, but more importantly, to my wife and children. And obviously, that's all happened, and that's all playing out. And, and we're working through those, all of those situations, but I just think it's important um, 
to be able to come to you folks. If it was me and I'm looking at it, uh, Brock said his sense is of, of uh, sorry Brock, if I'm referring to as Brock, um, Mr. Swartzel says, you know, immediate expulsion. And, you know, obviously I read here and I'm saying censure is more appropriate. Um, but without more around that of how you got to that spot and if you, you guys have the responsibility, the committee has the responsibility and also the legislature has the responsibility of, of deciding is that it or is there discernment to look further and deeper into what was all going on there and what was sort of motivating those moments. And I, I think that's tough work. If I was looking at me and looking at me in that situation, me, just hearing it, I would say expulsion was, was completely appropriate as an option. I put forward the censure because I think that if there's an opportunity to be able to redeem myself and to be able to come forward, I would ask that the alternatives, the, the alternative censure be, be put forward to the, to the House as well if the committee comes back with expulsion. But I know that that's your, your call with that. It's um, obviously this is all um, playing out in front. I, I would like to speak for one more moment if I can and then I'll do whatever questions you folks have from the report. I think I owe that to you all and to the public as well. Um, but I, the, the question is whether or not uh, what Mr. Sari knew or what, what Mr. Swartzel knew or what the speaker knew. Um, I, I don't know what they knew. I know they met with him several times. Um, I know they didn't go to Human Resources. We know all that. But I don't know what the hell you'd do with it if you knew. I don't know what, what they would do in that situation because it's such a unique spot. You end up in this position where, you know, what do you do with that? Knowing that he sent out this crazy email and not knowing really where his mind was at and what was going on, and maybe you heard it, maybe you knew there was a tape, probably didn't. I can't imagine that was disclosed and they didn't know about the texter. So I was kind of on an island trying to figure out who was doing this. So anybody that spoke to me, I'm looking at them thinking, are you involved in this? And in reality, I don't know that that was the case. Um, but I think in, inside of this, it was a series from process, we look at the process, you can say a series of unfortunate events the way that it happened, you could say it that way, but it was all set in motion by me. And I, I just want to come before you without the prepared statement in the censure and just tell you that I am, I am deeply and truly sorry for what I've put this committee through and um, the House and the, the smearing of that. And you folks have the responsibility of looking at qualifications and, and saying, is this just a really stupid email at a really dumb spot in somebody's life in a tape that's made about this, or is there more? And does this rise to expulsion or censure? And I know you guys are wrestling with that, and I understand that. So, but I just felt like, um, my, I did this in explaining this all on the front end against the advice of my attorneys, so just, just so that you're aware of that, it isn't the first time I didn't take somebody's advice, but um, if people have asked me who, you know, who's the texter, or whatever, and that continues to happen, law enforcement's looking into that. I don't know how really aggressive they've been to look at it, but they're, they're working through those details. There's two people I'm pretty sure that it's not, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's not me, and I'm pretty sure that it's not Chad Live and Good. Um, I can go on the record and tell you that. Um, so, but otherwise, um, I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to, um, to come before you today, even in, in the really, really harsh and difficult circumstances personally, to be able to hear and listen to and have my own words um, really condemning me. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Does one of your legal counsel wish to speak first? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, very briefly, uh, we're here to... Can you remind us of the name again? Just uh, Dan Randazzo. Okay, thank you. We're here to, to... You're here to examine the qualifications of Representative Corser. Uh, 
Um, and in looking at that, you have before you an incident with a trickle effect of a number of other incidents that followed. And the question for you is, is this a pattern of behavior uh, that is sufficient to um, be uh, qualified for expulsion? And I think before you make that decision, you have to look at Mr. Corser and his whole body of work, not this incident in isolation. Yes, he admits that it's a stain on this, on, on this uh, House of Representatives, it's a stain on anybody related to this incident. And he's taken full responsibility for that. In fact, in, in the audio tape that we heard today, he took full responsibility even back then and knew that there were going to be si significant, uh, if not detrimental, uh, things that flowed from, from his actions. But again, I think you have to look at not only these incidents, can't look at them in isolation. You have to look at him as a whole. And clearly, his constituents um, elected him to office because they thought he was fit. And they continue to support him. I know that I've looked at a number of emails and uh, that have been sent to him since this incident broke and in full support of him. In fact, while he walked out earlier today, uh, some of his supporters were here on a tour and, and offered uh, prayers for him uh, and still supported him. Uh, so I'm asking you uh, not to look at these incidents alone, but to look at his whole body of work and his character in general. Thank you. Thank you. Any of the other members? All right. Oh. Representative, with such huge examples of lying, disrespect, willful deceit, misdirection, disdain for fellow members, how are we supposed to believe that right now is the moment that you're actually being candid with us? Well, when you look at this situation and his explanation for why it occurred, it's a desperate man in a desperate situation making bad choices, and he's admitted to that. I, sir, I, you know, if that example alone were what we have to go with, but, I mean, you're encouraging us to take a broader view of all of the evidence, and what I have here, I mean, I have emails just from Monday where there's still just accusations uh, last Monday, accusations uh, towards other people, towards the other members of the House, uh, a lack of taking responsibility. We have forgeries on bluebacks, and I mean, just there is there is a continuing pattern here, and you're encouraging us to look at what the continuing pattern is. I'm concerned that the continuing pattern is not helping me believe the testimony today is what's, what is the genuine person. If I can, uh, Chairman McGroom, I appreciate the question. I think it's, uh, I think it goes to the kind of the point or the call of the question. Um, last week, even the, the steps since then, uh, obviously they've been out of emotion when it comes to my responses since the news story broke on August 7th. And, uh, one of the things I have to do is apologize to the committee, my misunderstanding on the front end uh, of really sort of the way that the committee was constructed. I thought you folks were getting handpicked evidence that was going to come to you and you weren't going to get the full evidentiary findings of the, the House, and that was my failure, um, my failure of understanding uh, just on the, on the front end of the whole thing. So I, I certainly have to apologize to you folks. Here it's 833 pages in the actual redacted portion. So. Uh, obviously, you folks have looked at a huge body of work, um, and so just just in looking at that, I you know, I think there's a um, I think you folks obviously have had had full access to the evidence, and I understand not understanding the difference between this and a criminal proceeding, uh, which has been pointed out to me uh, plenty of times. I I feel like that you folks have already seen the evidence. Some of it obviously is going to be passed across this table, and and in conversation from each of the people you call forward. I think you're calling forward the people that make sense for this this discovery process. 
obviously I think there should be, you know, there should be a few more when it comes to an understanding of the background, but I just tried to speak to that as far as the staff and also to the email itself because I felt like you folks needed to hear that and know that. Um, my heart is sincere when it comes to the idea of trying to move forward and go in the right direction. It is, and you know, I, I think inside of that, I think there's a couple of other there's a there's a couple of other things when it comes to my reaction since August 7th. You can just say it was it was responding and really responding sort of out of the, the idea of, of still being attacked and not feeling like there was going to be a fair shake. Everything I said wasn't necessarily uh, getting you know getting understood as me trying to explain it. When I did try to explain it, it was me casting accusations and dispersions on other people. And I really didn't appreciate the effect of that and how that was affecting the committee and also the rest of the membership. So again, it was, it was inside of that, um, there, was a, there was a lot going on. And I just want to apologize to you folks because obviously you guys have looked at the full evidentiary hearing or the full evidentiary package and have had an opportunity to look at it. Now the public obviously is looking through it as well. And um, and I, I, if you want to speak to the other issues in the report, I know there are eight underlying allegations. If you'd like to, I, I certainly would be happy to go through those. Well, Representative, I mean, I, I appreciate that you're trying to apologize and that you're telling us you're being honest now, but my question really still comes back to, you know, why now, why suddenly, um, I understand you didn't understand process, you didn't, you were under pressure and duress and things like that, but we see a long pattern here that even predates May, even predates the recordings within the investigation of dishonesty. And it's hard for me to accept that now is suddenly the moment when the light shines in and I can believe that this is not another attempt at misdirection. This is not another attempt at manipulation. And I'm wondering, what can you offer to verify? I mean, you called this committee before you even met. I mean, you could say you misunderstood the process, but I mean, we hadn't even been assigned and we're a kangaroo court. And so those misdirections and, and stuff, like you admit, are damaging to this process. But I need, and this committee are charged with determining, can we move, can the House maintain you in its presence and still believe that um, that somehow the behavior that we're seeing today is the real you and not what we've seen over several months is the real you. I appreciate that. No, I obviously the difficult circumstances all around and you know what is the sort of the piece I'm trying to be as real with you as I can. I don't come and tell you those stories, uh, telling you those stories because the, that's really the situation as far as my relationship with those men um, and also the email. I think it's tough. Like I said, I think just based on the email and the, the testimony there, you have to kind of call into question what was going on in that person's life. Either you can look at those incidents and if you want to speak to the issues before May 19th, you mentioned forgery, if you want to go through the House report um, and, and deal with those one at a time, I'd be happy to do that. If you're, if you're saying that the alleged misconduct inside of the House report, I'd be happy to address those. Other, other members' questions? Vice Chair Heisey. Thank you. Okay. Um, in your uh, in the tapes that I've heard, and there's more than one. I, I'm assuming you've heard all four tapes. I have not. I, there would be the opportunity to be able to hear them. I ran out of time um, because of uh, the other representative, her team being on it, and myself being um, being after that. Have you read uh, the uh, entire report? Uh, yeah, it was no. It was released obviously last night. I tried to get a copy over the weekend and was unable to procure it. All right. So you've had no opportunity to, no. Representative. You've been afforded the opportunity to come and view the report, same as the other representative. I couldn't actually. I uh, requested that on Wednesday. They were busy on Thursday. She was in there. We were able to see it when it came to Friday. Uh, we spent I think five hours with the material. I asked for a copy of it at that point. Um, there was some confusion as far as the ability to be able to give me that copy. I don't think it had been completely redacted at that point, and so I was not able to. But I will speak to the underlying allegations all the same if you, if you want to bring those out. Uh, the allegations or the evidence? The evidence, I'm sorry. So yeah. you can speak to the evidence? Well, whatever. If you, if you have an issue that you, you'd like to bring out, I'm, right. I'm, I, I know from the report and the nine pages and what the 
underlying allegations are, and I'll try to do my best to answer it. So in the tapes, you've described, you've told us today that that's, that wasn't you. That was, was that a different person? And uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on, on your state of mind then in those tapes? Well, I think I've already um, explained sort of my state of mind, uh, especially just the first one in my office, the difficulties that were there. Obviously then explaining in the second audio, I think it's mostly me that's speaking in the second audio. Um, I can't speak to the specificity on the other two. My understanding is they speak more to campaign um, or political stuff conversations in the last two audios that happened. So um, what, what person were you when you issued the 4,000 word Facebook uh, essay about a week ago? In that situation, I was responding obviously out of emotion. I did, and obviously that's the what we just talked about with uh, Chairman McBroom discussing the issues related to it and responding to say, um, you know, I didn't understand the, the makeup and that you folks had the full evidentiary package and we're going to have full access to that. And I think you folks have. So do you believe that you've been, um, that you were part of some kind of a, a conspiracy? Is some, some kind of a conspiracy has been, is being waged against you? Well, I, I would just go to um, the texts, uh, obviously, that were happening. I don't, I don't lay that at anybody's feet. I don't think the committee was involved in that. I, I don't think the leadership was aware of it. I think that was a separate thing that was going on that created, um, obviously, and, in, in, you know, when you have months and months and months of that, and uh, the, the personal pressure that was related to that uh, obviously created a different paradigm. Uh, for how all these things look and the way that they, they go together. So uh, obviously that person hasn't been found and uh, you folks will have to weigh whether or not those are contributing circumstances to the email itself and also the responses that happened. The last text actually happened on August 7th in relation to that. I know that that's not really a part of the qualifications that you folks are discussing, but um, for me it was, it was really paramount that that was continuing to happen, continuing the, the awareness, the tracking, the GPSing. Um, all of that, and that was the that was the world I was operating in. So the outlandish email that you concocted with your staff uh, that uh, is that just part of your past now, or do you still do you still own that? The May nineteenth email, uh, the 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 one that we reviewed yesterday with the the inoculate the herd uh, email, the one that you directed your staff to send out. Well, I. I I mean, obviously, he was, a, he was a friend of mine. I've spoken to that. He ended up being he was staff. We were off state time, off state hours, in a spot where he operated a consulting business, had his computer equipment, and, and worked for other, other political people. Um, I, I've already said publicly numerous times that I'm the one that uh, concocted it and put it together in some bizarre uh, attempt to try, and, to try and deal with the issues that were there. You believe that that email has brought this body into disre disrepute and, and shame? Yeah, I think, the, I think it's brought a lot of disrepute and shame to myself and my own family. And I think that uh, having the embarrassment brought to the house, I think, is, uh, is, is something that I certainly am, am uh, really, really sorry that, it, that that's happened. You apologize to your staff at all? You, you describe a, a, almost a family-type relationship with these two. Have you, have you personally apologized to them? I did, actually. I sure did. Um, actually, in the second tape, uh, you know, I apologized to Ben. You can hear that. And there were several other times that weren't taped where we had discussions about it, and uh, and just saying, you know, obviously it was a huge failure, and I know it was a disappointment to him, and um, the difficulties inside of that. And I know, um, you know, in in regards to uh, the others, I, I didn't have an opportunity to apologize to uh, Mr. Allard. Uh, in regards to that, that I can remember. I just can't remember. You, you state that this was a, I don't know, a, a moment of, uh, of extreme emotion brought about by, you know, various factors that were going on in your life, but you, you've said in the one, at least one of the tapes that I've seen, you, you, ref, you say that this is something that you've been thinking about for eight, nine, ten years, and you also make reference to a a prior incident two or three years ago where, where it sounds to me at least like you have you had done a similar type of false flag operation. How would you respond to that? No, there was a false flag operation or some kind of operation done on me in regards to the prior 
um, the prior election. Uh, I don't. I was not involved in the, the that whole situation. I would speak to the the other issue. I think in the in the if I remember the tape that we just that we just listened to, you know, talking about sort of the, the thinking about how this would all end. And I'm not really sure where that comment came from or what that really was derived to in that in that moment. Uh, I know all along the way I've wondered how this all would all end, you know, as far as my political time and, and what that would actually look like. And, you know, uh, I can't really speak to the specifics of that, that comment as to what was, in, what was going on at that second. Do you believe you spent any state money for the purposes of uh, perpetuating your affair? No, I think the uh, situation inside of the um, inside of that we had a series of, of intertwined personal business and um, also political uh, personal business, political official. The the situation was inside of that that, that we had a uh, we had an untenable work situation related to the personal relationships that I had. I don't think inside of that that I asked anybody to cover it up or hide it. Um, in any specific way, what I was asking them to do is to try and allow my family and myself to work through those things personally so that we have that opportunity to be able to do that. My wife found out that weekend, um, obviously in counseling, she's in separate counseling, we're going through those steps, I'm working with counselors myself in trying to work through those steps and trying to do that in private, and that was really what the situation was. I want to establish some clarity on that last answer, if I may. Um, interrupt my vice chair's line of questioning. Did you, uh, what, how did you just answer the question, did you misuse state resources? In, inside of that, I mean, obviously the, the, the misuse of state resources, there were personal conversations in the state house speaking specifically to the report. People wanted me to, to stipulate to everything in the report. The problem obviously with that is that there are some things where they say they may or may not be legal, may or may not be legal, um, no, no rules cited in some of the, some of the report findings. Um, and so there was no rule on some of those. So to stipulate to all of them, what are you actually stipulating to? So that's in the precursor to what you're saying. The misuse of state resources, it was clear in the audio tapes when it came to the, the conversations as far as personal and political stuff that was happening on state property. I absolutely, um, completely stipulate to, to that. I take full ownership of that. There were conversations that happened. There were conversations that happened in regards to our personal lives, um, both related to this, this stuff and also um, to the staff's personal lives um, and also to political happenings that were happening out in the... In the Rep Representative, I'm, I'm not uh, at this point trying to ask about misuse of um, conversations that were had. I'm asking about the state resources themselves. Are you saying yes or no to having misused state resources? Representative, I'm not understanding. Mr. Oh. Chairman, I, I think he stipulated to the report uh, that was generated regarding the misuse of state funds. And I guess the question, if you could rephrase it in specificity as to what? He's already stipulated to the report. Well, it's very clear within the House business office rules that state resources involve equipment, computers, office space, staff. So you're asking him if he used state resources other than what's already been in the report. Is that? No, I'm asking him. I'm seeing a lack of continuity here. Okay, the report says that you misuse state resources, including those things that I just listed. You're now at least being difficult to answer whether or not you misuse state resources. Representative Heise asked, you seem to say no, and now I'm asking if that's what you want to say. Are you saying yes or no to misusing state resources? I, I think Representative Heise's question was, did he misuse state resources with the affair? No, that's the relationship. He asked that's if he missed. That's not correct. That is correct. Fine. Uh, let's expand on that. Have you misused state resources? Okay. Well, we're going to go to the broader question. I mean, affairs, politics, whatever. I think I've already just in my prior statement said that as far as personal and the conversations that happened, there was clear. Um, clearly, there was a 
the use of state resources being the property and the facilities to facilitate those conversations. Hold on, Representative. There's a point of order. Mr. Chairman, I asked the same question to, to Ms. Cameron yesterday, and her attorney and the board didn't allow her to, to answer it because of the relevance, and I'm going to raise that objection now. I, I appreciate the point of order, Representative, but there's a distinctive difference here. Um, she stipulated very specifically to all the things in the report, and now Mr. Corser, in my listening, has suddenly created an inconsistency between what he has stipulated and what was in the report and what he's saying here in front of us now. Mr. And that lack, that lack of consistency, I believe, is important to, to dive into. But, Mr. Chairman, he did stipulate to what was in the, the report. And then in his comments seemed to refute that. Okay. I think my, um, what I was, I was speaking to the situation with the relationship. There was clear misuse of, of state resources just because of the interplay between the personal, the political, and the official. And I, in my statement today, I, I clearly said that those things really facilitated the misuse of state resources. So I was speaking to it generally, uh, Chairman Heise, as far as specifically to the, um, to the relationship. Uh, I, I was speak I've already spoken to the fact that I think that's where the clarification is coming in. I could be wrong, but... Okay. Meaning there were misuse of state resources in conversations that happened, and it's pretty clear on the tapes that those happened at the State House. If you're asking about further than that, I'm, I, I guess you just if you can give me some clarification, I'd be happy to answer it. Okay, so you believe that you misused state resources? Oh, yes. Okay, thank you. Representative Hulin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Representative Corser and Council for being here. I, I just have a, a series of what I think are very short, uh, short questions that are you're able to answer almost with a yes or no, and some of which relate to comments I've heard attributable to you. Uh, the first is on August 31st, you said that the House Business Office, quote, doctored the report, close quote, and that it was a, quote, political hit, close quote. Do you maintain uh, or repudiate your words of October, th August 31st? The August 31st email, I was posing a series of questions in regards to, you know, uh, whether or not the process was going to be fair and I've been allowed a fair hearing or a fair adjudication of the underlying issues I didn't feel at that point and that was out of emotion um, in regards to that so uh, I, I honestly I think you folks have looked at it I feel very confident that you folks have looked at the record um, I looked at it, the portions that I could look at I think it's been released to the public I don't think there's any um, you know hidden voodoo that's that's occurred uh, the public is now going through and looking at the the various pieces so I think that you, you brought a lot of transparency to the things that are here, and I appreciate that in, in regards to all of that. So my fear was, obviously, is that this wouldn't be um, the opportunity to be able to, one, even speak to you folks in regards to the issues, the underlying issues that are here. That was my, my sense of it. That has been dispelled. So if I, if I understand you correctly, you're now saying under oath that the report was not doctored. Is that correct? Well, I wouldn't know what happened um, between the House. I didn't read all the 133 pages that were released, so I couldn't, I couldn't speak to that. To the best of your knowledge, at this point, you have no evidence. To the best of my knowledge, yes, sir. Yes, Rob. And, and you, you do not believe at this point that it was a, quote, political hit? I don't. I, asking that question, it was actually with a question mark, I think, after that. And the same, same question with respect to your comment that you were being, quote, targeted is a form of political retribution. So I'm taking it that you're testifying today that you do not view this process as a form of political retribution. No, I have not. No. Uh, then I'm just with respect to the uh, uh, the report itself, do you do you agree that the, with the findings of the House Business Office that there was official misconduct and misuse of state resources? Yes. Do you agree that you engaged in deceptive, deceitful, and dishonest conduct? Yes. Do you believe that you abused or misused your state employees? Um, in regards to 
there as identified in the uh, business office report Yes, I spoke to that at the beginning right after my censure resolution to explain sort of the background of that. I think those moments inside of the emails, uh, those were moments. And uh, I, I think that they were by and large well treated. I think there were moments where it was obviously there were, uh, I could have treated them better certainly. Um, but, uh, but again, they were very personal relationships and, and uh, so we were dealing with those issues. And most of those issues were, I would say were, um, as I said before, were caused by me, the lack of real clear, um, bright lines between work and personal in those relationships. Did you uh, instruct or allow your staff to forge your signature on blue bags? No, I did not. What, I think that needs some clarification. Um, forging obviously is done without my knowledge or my consent. The, the events that led up to uh, to that week. I can explain if you want to hear it. If you don't, somebody can object, I guess. Um, inside of that, the, I wasn't going to be uh, available the day that those came back. I spoke to my chief of staff. I asked what was the process to be able to do that. In the legal profession, we do it. Uh, it's called signing for another. And, uh, and so you, you can sign for other attorneys, attorneys I've never met with their permission. And so I was, I was falling under that. I asked uh, my chief of staff at that point to speak with the business office to say, is there an exception for that? My understanding was, and they affirmed to me, that yes, it was not a problem to do that. I should have checked myself in regards to that. Um, but that's actually how it happened. So when they came back, they let me know, and I said, yeah, well, if, if it's okay, go ahead and do it. So I should have checked and, and been more involved in that. Thank you. Representative, are you saying that the House Business Office told your staff it was all right to have somebody else sign the bluebacks for you? No, I don't know that they ever had, my staff had ever had any communications with the House Business Office, but they informed me that it was okay to do it. It still falls on my shoulders, uh, regardless. I don't think it was forgery. It's probably the idea that they were signed by staffers, but I was aware of the fact that they did it. At that point, not understanding that there was any problem with that situation. You, un you understand that it was your responsibility to know these rules? Right. I, I think I've clarified that I should have checked with the House Business Office myself and not relied on the staff in that situation. Representative Hulin, did you have I more? I have two, two more short questions. Thank uh, you. Uh, Representative, you may have answered this, but I, I just wanted to confirm it for the record. Uh, I, I saw your reference, your characterization of this committee as a uh, kangaroo court, and I believe I think I heard you say you would no longer hold that view. That's correct, yeah. I, would, I mean, I would just reiterate that that is not the case. I, I'm assuming you folks have had the full ev evidentiary package. That's my assumption. You guys have had the opportunity to look through it. You can determine if there's more maliciousness or more misconduct or these really the acts of a desperate man who sent a really ridiculous and stupid email um, that is sort of baffling and mind-boggling. Um, and it, does that what it amounts to? And I, I know you folks will wrestle with that issue and try to discern what's the right steps forward. My, my final question at this point, Mr. Chairman, is uh, Representative, do you believe the House should accept or tolerate the conduct that you engaged in? In, in regards to all of it? As, as so. reflected in the House Business Report, which I think you, you previously characterized as a, a balanced report or an accurate report. No, I, I, I don't think that the House should tolerate it at all. That's why I said I think you folks are going to wrestle with the idea. You know, does this rise to the idea of censuring? Uh, is this a pattern of behavior? Or is it a ridiculous email and a ridiculous moment and some guy's really, really hard life that happened to end up on tape? Um, I think that that's a, that's a really tough situation. I just bring forward the censure because uh, in my heart of hearts, I'm falling on the grace and mercy of the court in saying I, I would ask for a lesser penalty than, uh, than expulsion in that situation. I, honestly, that's really the situation. So um, I know you folks have to wrestle with that. I know that won't be an easy task, and nor will it be an easy task for the full house. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Hoopland. Uh, Representative Liberati. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Todd. Yes. Um, so, Representative Corser, there seems to be a little confusion in my mind anyways uh, on the May 19th tape recording about, the auth about how you authored the email, how it was developed, um, the false flag email. Um, there was a phone call that was from Cindy, you said. I, I want to ask you, is that, was it truly Cindy? That is accurate. 
Um, how much did she know? She has stated that <clears throat> she didn't know the full details. Um, can you can you maybe just give us a little narrative on on the authoring and the editing of that email with Cindy and Joe? I would be happy to. Yeah, the the situation she had really bad signal that night. Obviously, I was in. I've already said in sort of a, um, a a different state, both for health reasons, also just just fatigue and sort of my own personal, um, you know, my personal low spot. And I obviously reached out to a friend in that situation. Uh, what happened was that call came in at that moment. I'm recollecting. So, um, in as far as the situation that happened. Um, so I, I just tell you all that because in, in reality I wrote that email in the moments after I had asked Ben to come in and see me. So it was, I hadn't, she didn't know the content of the email, she didn't know that it had actually gone out at that point. Um, she didn't know that there was actually, she didn't, she didn't know any of those details. So um, I, don't, I don't think she would have in any way approved um, of, the, uh, of the action uh, whatsoever. But, uh, she didn't. Uh, it, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, well, on the t on the tape, <clears throat> you stated that you actually had discussions with with Joe and and Representative Gamera, um composing the email, and they actually I think quote was they actually wanted it more that towards her or more leaning towards her to take more responsibility. Now that seems a little more involved discussion than what you just stated. Right, yeah, I, I, don't, re I don't remember how that all played out. I just know that I wrote it before. Um, I, I, when you listen to the tape, I'm not exactly sure what I'm referencing there, but that was the, that was the segment um, of conversation that we had as far as the, as far as the communication. Um, I don't, I can't, I'm sorry, I wish I could tell you how that all played out in, in regards to that. I was, with Ben, I was still also, which we haven't talked about, I don't know that it's, it's pertinent. I'm trying to figure out what, what really is going on around me in the environment around me. And so I don't know if he's involved in it. And we, I've asked him point blank several times, um, was he the, you know, was he involved in it? Did he know? Did he give information? Because this was very, very detailed. And the person knew a lot about me and my whereabouts. So uh, what I'm telling him in some of those comments is really to try and, I'm trying to figure out, is he actually the person? And uh, that's, that's where I was at with that. So it might have been that I'm telling him something that um, it's just layer, layering out a story to try and figure that out for him. Okay, well, th thank you. Let's, let's move to the next, the next tape recording, the next, I think it was two days later, when Representative Gamert was actually in her office. I think that, that tape took place in, in her office, um, <clears throat> discussing the email, and she doesn't seem to question any anything. She's, she's, she's going along when you're apologizing to Ben. She apologizes to Ben. Um, I, I'm just having a, I, I'm trying to, to pinpoint the difference in uh, your composing the email, uh, whether you composed it, and, and her knowing how much did she know about the email. Uh, you said you believe, now uh, that's your opinion, but you believe that she would have objected to some of the content of that email? Is that what you just said? Well, um, my looking back, I object to the content of the email or sending it myself. So I don't think any person in good conscience would, would you know, accept the idea that it was happening or the way that it happened. And in those moments, I... She was in those moments, too. Yeah, no, I'm... Did she go... She went along with it? Well, I, she didn't actually know... Uh, my understanding is she didn't actually know or had didn't see the actual email and didn't know that it had actually gone out until 21st. Um, I think she was. It was shown to her by a reporter, if I remember correctly. But I wasn't there. First of May. I think so. Yeah, I think in the afternoon. So I don't think she saw much of it. Just that there was um, some of the content. The person was saying, "What we did find out at that moment, uh, what what, you know, obviously the, there was lots of things going on that night, and really what I was trying to do is do something that the the person that was sending these texts." Um, wouldn't expect and try to get them to do something different to see if they could, I could get them to reveal themselves. So, so just to give you, um, just to kind of finish that thought, so on the 21st when that happened, um, then I was approached by a reporter who had a copy of it and they said that um, they had it from a confirmed source that I was the author of the email. So there's only one person in that situation. So I was trying to drive back in some weird way, not knowing if it's the people around me or who was involved in it. 
um, what action was going on in, in the background. And, but she didn't have any of the content, I would say, until it was sometime in the afternoon on May. And I don't know how much she even read then. I, she just know you'd have to, you know, said what was the illicit understanding or whatever. So your comments during that phone call, uh, what was on the line, were not necessarily accurate to Ben when when you were saying yes, she's you were talking to her about the event, trying to get Ben to send it. Yes, yeah. over the top. She knew it was going to be an over the top email, just didn't know the exact wording. Yeah, I don't even know how much of my comment she heard because, like I said, as a sketchy, I'm waiting to hear from her. Do you, you know, is that all right? But I, but it's a broken signal in regards to that. It was a very short conversation, and then it just ended. Okay, one, so. one more question um, at the, at this point. Uh, yes, actually, it is. It is in the same line. Okay. Um, uh, why I'm asking these questions to you uh, is I'm trying to determine. Well, uh, let me just ask you. You have asked for censure. Representative Gamert has asked for censure. The House Council, uh, the Majority Council, has recommended expulsion for you and censure for her. I'm just wondering, do you do you think that's fair? Do you see differences in your actions yourself? Um, well, obviously, I, I would. I think I've kind of explained um, my actions as best I can, uh, looking in reverse. Uh, some of them are explainable. Some of them are not explainable in any sort of rational, reasonable sense. And I'm trying to give you folks the the best testimony that I can. I really am trying to do that. Uh, you know, I, I think in in her situation, obviously, she you know she's been allowed to censure or there's a movement to try and recommend censure, uh, you know, you guys will have to kind of wrestle with other differences between our actions in regards to that. I, I you know, I, I can't really comment to that. I, I think that the censure is appropriate for her. Um, I think it, it, I would ask for it from, from you folks as well. I think it's an appropriate step in, in my regard as well. Um, I can see why there's some real question as far as the uh, the expulsion option, the way that that works. I can't really speak to the intricacies of how they arrived at censure versus expulsion for her. Um, I, I think it's, to me, I look back and I say, what is it? You have some conversations in the state house that amount to misuse of taxpayer funds, and I've said I would certainly reimburse the state if they want to calculate how much that is. Um, and you have a ridiculous email sent out by a guy in a desperate moment, and does that amount to enough to, to censure or expel? I mean, you have to look at sort of the way those things have played out with other members, and you folks have to wrestle with as a, as a legislature to decide what is the standard for qualifications for expulsion versus censure. And I, I think that that's the situation. So, uh, Representative Liberati, I can't, um, I, I really can't tell you the, the distinction that was made for uh, House Council determining the censure option versus the expulsion option. Thank you. Uh, Representative, I, I would like to uh, go back a question from Representative Liberati on the email and the conversation with Representative Gamrat that evening. It seems very obvious from the conversation on the phone that you had at least at some point already talked with her about doing an email. Maybe not the content, but that there would be a false flag email. When did that occur? When was that previous conversation? I think it was. I think it was earlier that day. But I, I now we're thinking back and doing it in retrospect. Um, but I, I, he was asking about the content and knowing it. Um, I'm, I'm assuming there. Were, I'm working with somebody. I'll. You know, it was a conversation saying, "Hey, I'm going to try and connect with Ben and see about about doing something to take a step in that direction." I I really can't remember the the details in relation to that. But but I think she knew that I was attempting to put something in motion, but I don't know that, there, well, I know there is no way that she could know the actual content at that point, so. Uh, Vice Chair Heisen. I think I noted that in the thing, I, you know, I think even inside of it, I think I noted that. You were investigated by the House Business Office, correct? Uh, yes. You, you, and you were interviewed by them? I was. Okay. Did you, did you at any time, did you ever lie to the House Business Office? I don't, um, I, 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 I don't think so. I mean, there might be a clarification you want to make specifically. I'd be happy to clarify. Just asking, have you taken any steps to delete any evidence relative to this case uh, or destroy anything connected to this matter since, uh, since it first came to light? 
I don't really delete anything, so I just, it's a bad habit of mine. I don't think I have any texts that are deleted, or if they are, then it's inadvertent. So I don't have a habit of, uh, of deleting anything. Okay. I'm, I'm confused about your relationship with your former staffers. You've described them as brothers, frat brothers, uh, almost like family. But yet, you've, in your answers to Rep Liberati, it, it, it seemed to me that you still think that these two, or one of them, is the, uh, the extortion texter uh, that, you've, that you've been concerned about. You, could you elaborate on that? Well, I think the, it, that's the difficulty. I mean, it really is something that is uh, difficult for myself in regards to just dealing with personally. Um, if these guys knew and how they knew and how early they knew, my hope and prayer is that they're not involved Excuse in it. Excuse me, Representative, there's a point of order. Turn your microphone on, Representative. Turn your microphone on, Representative. Uh, you know, nowhere, I mean, we're not investigating the texter. We're trying to, the qualifications of both of them. There's nothing to do with that in the report. I agree, Representative. We'll move on from that. Okay. Um, uh, pass for now. Thank you, Vice Chair Heisey. Uh, Representative LaFontaine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so this committee was established to determine your fitness and if you're able to continue to hold the office that you have today. And as I'm sitting here, what I'm hearing from you are a lot of excuses, and I have read through this report, but I want to talk a little bit about your conduct and your presentation today. First off, you showed up late. That was a little bit disrespectful to the committee, and you showed up late coming in here. You, in explaining stuff, described yourself as desperate, that you have a hard life, that you acted emotionally when posting certain things online. You described your B-rating email as a moment that you had with your staffers. I don't care, as a staffer, well, I previously was, I don't care if it was a moment, I don't care if it was a minute, I don't care if it was a month. It was unacceptable. You do not treat staff like that. You also claim you were under pressure in sending the ludicrous email, and you didn't recognize yourself. So, in all of this, do you personally feel you are fit to continue representing the 90,000 people or so that reside in the 82nd district? Yeah, I appreciate the, um, obviously this morning dealing with uh, my own testimony as I came in. Uh, obviously it's a huge issue uh, out of my truck, um, trying to collect myself emotionally and, and try to get myself together and, and to come in to even be able to face you folks and walk through these steps. So um, I think there is, you have to look at the character and fitness and what those qualifications are. When I look at it, I was elected by the people of Lapeer County and you know they saw that I was fit to serve. I believe that this is a uh, obviously a moment. It is certainly a um, difficult one in my life and I'm not trying to make excuses today. That wasn't my intention. I was trying to provide clarification that's all I'm trying to do, and I apologize if it comes off as being excuses. I wanted to give you folks the background and try to answer as honestly as I could in relationship to all of those issues. I don't blame the difficulties in my life for any of the, the failures and responsibility that I have. They're my failures. I, I think I've tried to say that. If I haven't, I'll say it again. They're failures of mine, and they're failures of my responsibility. Going to the underlying question, you know, what what's the the measurement of fitness you know the measure of fitness of trying to serve i think the responsibilities that, that lie before me one to, to um my family to the people of my district and then you know as a believer in christ i mean there's no measurement by which that failure doesn't um you know where i don't fall short i think that that's the case and, and you folks have to to wrestle with is that a pattern did that happen? Um, are there other, you know, other extenuating circumstances or not? Or is this really a momentary, uh, sort of a momentary situation with some really bizarre um, influences that, that caused it to happen? And I don't, I don't believe it's the, the, this other person, this anonymous person. I set all those in motion by the relationship that I had, which, was, um, which has been well documented and obviously played out over the last 30 days all over the world for people to see. So I, I, I apologize for showing up late in, in regards to that. 
Thank you. Thank you, Representative uh, Vice Chair uh, Chirkin. Thank you. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, the first one being uh, the inoculate to herd email. Who who did you send that out to, and where did it go? It ended up. It was a. Um, I start. I have a very large email list of, of people. I think it's. Um, it might be as many as forty thousand people that the email list is for. Um, it didn't go out to all those folks. I started with just a. Um, I started out sending it, and, and it was small batches, and so it was a, a batch, and then another batch, and another batch of, in the hundreds. And I was doing it until the texters did something. So the idea was it starts on the on the twentieth, it goes out twenty first. By the time we get to the twenty first, in that situation, um, it the texter responded and said, I know that you're the one that did it. And so he said, change your password. You can see the text, change your password. At that point, I stopped it. Um, because then I, either one, he was in my inbox, or two, um, and at that point, changing passwords again, going through that, having the phone swept again, working through that, um, trying to come up with what were those situations. All that's obviously peripheral stuff, and maybe it doesn't make any difference uh, to the the qualifications, but that's really the situation. So it stopped at that point. So um, it was, I don't know how many hundreds it was that, that it went out to. Did any of the uh, representatives in the House or the Senate get this email? I don't know. I, I, you'd have to ask them. I got forwarded around quite a bit after it went out to those folks. So um, I know most people, it, when you get an email like that, it goes to spam anyway. But I couldn't tell you if any actual representatives received it or not. Um, there has been some notations in here, and, and you might have turned it in, but you, you have a you had a computer, and I know Sergeant Dixon went to your office in your home to try to retrieve it. Did that computer ever find its way back to the house business office? I'm unaware of the situation with Sergeant Dixon uh, tried to retrieve uh, a computer at my house or my office. Well, then my next follow-up question is, do you have any property that still belongs to the House of Representatives? I do not. As a matter of fact, there were two two laptops that were in the back of my um, that were in my truck. Uh, I, I didn't know the House Business Office was was you know that they needed those back. I returned them as soon as I, I found that out. I had, I rarely used either the laptop or that Surface. It didn't work very well uh, when it came to. Uh, administration. That's not to the technology part. It's just probably the operator uh, on my end. But uh, there, there was very little that I did actually on either one of those units, and I informed the House Business Office when I handed those off to Tim Bowen and uh, whatever they did to try and retrieve the information that was on there. One was used by I think it was re used by Mr. Allard, and the other one was used by Mr. Graham. I really didn't use the House technology, um, the, the technology apparatus that was there. You uh, yesterday gave us a letter. Uh, Representative Gamrat came in and gave us a letter. And you both basically, uh, she, in, in my own words, she pled guilty. She fell on the sword. Have you had any conversations with Representative Gamrat within the last 10 days other than anything pertaining to the legislation portion of our jobs? No, the, my, the conversations in regards to, you're talking about the letter as far as stipulating to? Well, you, you gave us a letter, she gave us a letter. And, and my question is, did, have you had any conversation with her in the last 10 days? Not related to anything other than the, um, the you're talking about the legislative stuff that's going on? Well, I mean, other than that, you might have talked to her about legislative stuff, but did you have any other personal conversation? No. I. I I can't really recall the, the last 10 days. I've really been focused on this as far as the, as far as the letter. This was prepared as we were trying to work with, um, uh, work in the, to try and come up with what would a censure option even look like. And I wanted to present this folk, to you folks in regards to that. Um, so the, the, the letter was prepared with my counsel who were uh, attempting, obviously, to uh, inform you folks that I would, that would like a censure. I have one last question, and, and it, it's in the book, but when, I want to verbally hear from you, when did you know that you were being taped by your staff? I, I, as far as my understanding of it, well, I knew um, on August 3rd when uh, Chad Livingood came to my office at that point and played a short clip of it. 
um, that Ben Graham had, uh, then taped me back as far as May 19th. There was a sense inside of that, um, that that had been going on in the office for some time because of the way that there was almost an interrogation type style by the staff that was in the office. And they also had noted to uh, the other staff members, uh, Ann Hill and, and Karen Kucher, uh, who's now, who now has a married name, uh, that the offices were bugged. Um, now, I don't know what that related to or whatever. Now, we know that actually there were some tapings going on inside the office. I don't know that it was wiretapping or whatever, but um, they made comments to other staff in regards to that, that, that they were bugged. So I, I got the sense of that. Um, obviously, the personal relationships overshadow all of that. Like, would they really be involved in this? Would they be involved in the background and doing these types of things? And, uh, and so I, I, it was difficult to be able to reconcile those two things with the personal relationships I had with them. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. Thank you, Vice Chair Chirkin. Um, Representative Verhulman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative, in response to uh, Vice Chair Heisey's question, you, you indicated that you believed you were being truthful when interviewed on August 17th by the business office. Yeah, I, I can't remember. Obviously, those they took note of that, and then I came back and did a um, some adjustments to that with um, with Doug um, and uh, walked through that. But I didn't see the final copy. I, I never did see the final copy in regards to that. I asked for it, but I think just administratively, I never did see the final. Let me let me ask you this: uh, the report indicated that you said that Representative Gamrat did not know about the email cover-up until she was shown a copy of the email on the House floor by a reporter. Is that what you told the House Business Office? Right. I don't know how I I mean, obviously, the, to expand on that, she knew there was a meeting. She, that's on the tape, uh, which we knew at that point. She didn't know the, I don't think she knew sort of the, well, she didn't know the content in regards to that, and I think that's what I'm speaking to. Her statement to the business office was that she did not know about the email cover-up until she was shown a copy on the House floor by a reporter. And I think we've just heard uh, uh, her call in on the uh, audio of May 19th, and there was a second audio of a meeting with both you and Representative Graham at present where it was very, very obvious that she knew she may not have known the specifics, she may not have read the email, but it was very clear, at least to me, that she was aware of the of the email going out and what I would characterize as a cover-up. So I'm having difficulty reconciling your statement of August 17th to the House Business Office with the two tapes. Uh, and so I guess I'm asking you to would you clarify, to clarify your try response to. to Representative Heisey or, or, or maintain it. Yeah, no, I, I would simply say she, you know, Obviously, she knew about um, that we were putting some plan in motion. She knew the generalities in, reg in regards to that. Uh, I would say sometime on May 19th somewhere, did she know the content and that it actually had happened? She didn't, I don't think she knew that until the second tape. Uh, but I, even at that point, she still had not seen the content until we went into session that day and it's shown to her, I think, by a reporter, but I can't, I can't remember. You are comfortable in, in, in reconciling that with your statement that she did not know about the email cover-up until she was shown a copy on the House floor by a reporter? What I mean, in the view of those, uh, the, the tape recordings that we've all listened to, you, you believe that that, would be, with that statement made on August 17th to the House Business Office was truthful? Yes, I, obviously the House Business Office is a compilation. If I looked at it further, um, you know, to clarify, could have clarified everything that we just talked about again. Uh, but in, in regards to what she knew about the content, I didn't say content at the House Business Office. Let me ask you this. Uh, if I asked you, and I am asking you, did Representative Gamrit know about the email cover-up prior to being shown a copy of the email on the House floor by a reporter, what would your response be? She knew that I had met with Ben Graham and that I was putting something in motion. Ben left that night. Ben had refused to do it. Her assumption at that point is that it didn't happen. So, so there was no, she didn't, so essentially at that point it kind of failed. And then it was renewed the next day. I think it was the next day. And then at that point it was put in motion. I reaffirmed to her in the, in the 21st. I don't know what she, um, what she understood as far as the content. What I'm trying to tell you is that I don't think she knew that until we actually came to the floor that day. 
you are comfortable saying uh, both on August 17th and today that you believe the statement that she did not know about the email cover up until she was shown a copy on the email of, of the email on the House floor by a reporter is an accurate statement, a truthful statement? Well, yes. On, on the 19th, what I'm trying to tell you is that. I'm asking you. You told the House office, the business office on the 17th that Representative Gamry did not know about the cover-up until shown a copy of the email on the House floor. And I'm having great difficulty reconciling that statement with the May 19th or, and the May 20 or 21st audio recording. And, and, you know, your testimony is your testimony, but when I hear her participating in a discussion with you and staff members, I can't reconcile that with your statement to the business office, and it's not for me to reconcile. If you're if you're comfortable that that statement was true on the 17th, and you're standing by it today, that's your that's your statement. Yeah, thank you, Representative Hewlin. Um, I would just say what I was speaking to in my mind when I was talking to the House Business Office is the content or the severity or where where that was at. I tried to correct those statements. Like I said, I didn't see the finals of those. Well, if you had an opportunity today. To correct that statement, would you revise the statement you made or, or you're reported to have made to the House Business Office on August 17th? Well, yeah, I would say that it was the content that I was speaking to. If I'm not looking at the statement that you're talking about, but I would go through and actually try to explain the steps that we've tried to talk about here today in regards to what happened on May 19th, in regards to all of the various issues related to that through the 21st. It was my understanding she didn't see the content or what really had happened until she got to the House floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go. Thank you, Representative. At this time, in order to fulfill the House rules to not be in committee without leave from the session, we will recess until we're granted leave by the House.